Master, may I be so honest? Could I admit the way I feel? I'm hurting. And it seems that you've forsaken. And I wonder if your love for me still real. All my friends think I am happy, unaffected by this trial. They can't see the pain I'm hiding just underneath my smile, Master. I can't live this way anymore. So today I make my choice. I choose to believe that you were faithful, and my heart is in your hand. And this mystery that I face today. Is part of a greater plan. I choose not to be discouraged when the sun will not break through. I have a choice of trusting you. So, Lord, this is what I choose. I know the road will not be easy, and I know I'll have my weaker days. And Satan will tell me I don't mean it when I say I'll trust God all the way. But that really doesn't matter. I refuse to hear him out. With my faith, I'll find the power that can overcome all doubt. Lord, I've never felt so strong as when I'm resting in your arms. to believe that you were faithful and my heart is in your hands and this mystery that I face today is part of a greater plan I choose not to be discouraged when the sun will not break through I have a choice of trusting you so, Lord, this is what I choose. I choose to believe and this mystery that I face today is part of a greater plan. I choose not to be discouraged when the sun will not break through. I have a choice of trusting you. So, Lord, this is what I choose. This is what I so glad to see you. Hey, I bet when you went out to your car this morning, it wasn't blazing hot. No, I, I, was, I, was, I was cold, so that's a good sign. So we hope it keeps that up. Uh, we're so 
happy anytime we can be here for church services. God has blessed us, but we're even happier when we have new faces in our crowd. And I've had an opportunity to meet uh, two new families, and I, I'm sure there's some more here that I, maybe I haven't met. And of course, those that are returning visitors, we're so grateful as a church that you would choose South Point Baptist Church on this Sunday morning. We've got some uh, guest cards in the pew rack that if you if you dare to, care to, fill out any information. I, I told a family this morning we won't email you two or three times a day, I promise you. But if you uh, some information, help us get to know you a little bit better. You can also scan it uh, with your phone and, that, that, and you can fill it out digitally. After the service, we have two welcome desks. Um, if you'll take your, um, uh, take your visitor's card to the welcome desk, we've got a, we've got a free gift that we just, just uh, to give you as a token of our appreciation that you worship with us today. All right, Josh, what do you got for me here? Well, we are, uh, as of today, we are one month away from our mission trip to the Dominican Republic. We leave on November the 8th, and so we're meeting today. Our mission team members are meeting. We're going to have a quick luncheon, and then we're going to kind of go over some stuff, and then uh, I don't want it to be a terribly long meeting, so uh, give the children time to leave the Taylor Hall, and then we can come in there and have lunch. Speaking of food, next Sunday uh, we're having the men's breakfast in Taylor Hall and I know our men enjoy that. I think we had, I don't know, 45, 46 last. Uh, all of you visitors and members, men are welcome to come 8 o'clock on Sunday morning. It is a full, full breakfast and you will enjoy that. Our missionary friend and really consider him a good friend, Jacques Alexander, uh, is going to be with us on Sunday, October 22nd. He is going to give us a report about things in Haiti and how chaotic uh, it has evolved there. Uh, he is currently living in Tampa, ministering to two Haitian churches, um, and so he's not far from us. He's going to come and give us a report on the work there in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, and uh, he's just a good preacher too, so it'll be a blessing. Also, um, Let's see, today is the 8th. Next Sunday is the final items due that you're donating for our Christmas shoebox. Meriden's Pearl shoebox uh, is due next Sunday. The packing day will be an, a church-wide event. We won't have different meetings like we normally do. Uh, we'll, we'll come together and um, uh, we are going to have that, that packing night. Uh, we're going to pray over the boxes. You'll get a chance to pack a box or two or three, and uh, we hope to have 300-plus boxes that we pack um, to kind of help for our workers that night and any members that come up, I think around, Brother Jake, you said around 5.30 or so, the food truck is going to come and let our volunteer workers that are working in there, let them uh, grab something first, and then you can come may set some tables up um, in the driveway here maybe uh, so you can eat uh, before you come in. Uh, the packing, um, Miss Katie, are you here? Uh, start about 7 o'clock, right? Uh, start about 7 o'clock. So normal, normal permitting time, okay? All right, and then Trunk or Treat, our community outreach, Tuesday, October the 31st from 6 o'clock to 8 o'clock. Sign-up lists are here in Taylor Hall foyer. The black um, desk there has sign-up sheets, and, and Josh has got some pictures there. It's just from past. You can come and dread. That was, I think, the college and career uh, were kind of American. Um, and you can uh, have, we need, we need trunks signed up for, and uh, you can theme them out. Of course, no, no scary stuff, just there's enough stuff that's scary uh, anyway, but uh, uh, just different themes there. And um, we'll have probably a couple thousand people come through our property on that day, and uh, we need help with security, help with parking. We are going to do the hayride for the kids, um, and it's just be a good night. It's something we started, I don't know how many years ago, Linda, we started it, but 
Um, we, we did it as a trial, and we have so we get a chance to meet so many of our neighbors and invite them to church and give them a tract. Um, we can't not do it. The, the, the response is so great. So looking forward to that. So don't forget about that, okay? All right, don't forget that sign-up sheet there again. All right, I think I'm done. No more slides. Brother Lynn, you come and lead us. All right, let's stand once again. Well, I'm
song. I, I love that song. It reminds me um, with the message that I, I'm preaching today. I, I thought about this, and it was very difficult not to preach a song about the call. I, I'm just going to uh, preach a preach a sermon about the, the call after you know that they're going to be singing that song. And uh, man, my, my heart immediately went um, to scriptures of the return of Christ and thinking of um, His return and what that day will be like. And uh, an exciting an exciting day. For us, for those who are followers of Jesus Christ, a confusing day um, and a terrifying day uh, for those who are not. Um, but it, it also uh, makes my mind uh, go to this thought of, uh, of being ready for the call and being, being ready. And, and will he come and find you faithful? That, that just stood out to me. And when they, that last time when they went through that, that course and they sang that part, will he come and find you faithful? Faithful, and every time I, I, I get to sing that part of that song, uh, I, I'm challenged by that by that thought. And um, thinking along the lines of what I'm going to be preaching on today, uh, as they as they sang that, staying focused, right? Staying focused on the things that God has for us, the thing that God has called us to do. This morning, I was able to um, speak to and hear hear from a couple of our ladies. I wouldn't want to call them out and embarrass them, but uh, who just this week in a normal conversations with their neighbors or people that they were around this week um, were inviting people to church. They were finding natural ways in the midst of a conversation to invite them to trunk or treat. They, they knew we had an event like, like trunk or treat coming up. And man, you know, you should come to trunk or treat with us or you should come visit our church with us. And, and starting up those conversations. Others, I was out um, doing visits this week and, um, and some of our, our members who have been um, struggling and their health has been, been down and uh, being able to see with, uh, sit with uh, Dan and Debbie Principe and uh, spend some time with them and, and others and, and, and hearing from them the encouragement um, that, that they had from our church members who were going to their house, were sitting with them. One of them shared how... Um, one person, as they were sitting in the house, and it happened to me while I was standing there, another one of our church members pulled up and showed up at their house uh, to check on them, to see how they were doing. And, uh, and, and then she sat there and she said, you know, Sunday, last Sunday, somebody brought me lunch, and as they were bringing, bringing us our dinner, and as they were bringing us our dinner, someone else from the church showed up and was standing right there at the door, and I'm sure that they thought, uh-oh, I didn't bring this much food. Uh, but... But, you know, it, it's just amazing. And, and what I, I say that to say this, you know, we, we, get, we can get caught up in a lot of things in our world, can't we? Sure. We are busy people. We got a lot of things going on. And it is very easy to be distracted by everything that's going on, everything that, that is important things, things that matter. And it's easy to get our head in the clouds and miss what God has for us right now. And, uh, and I was just encouraged to hear that about our church, that there were people that were taking the time to say, no, you know what, I know what matters right now. These people matter. And I, I, I mean, honestly, I was, I was in that moment of, you know, I'm, I need to make this visit. I need to go see them and check on them and see how they're doing. But I also need to have a sermon for Sunday. People expect that, you know. <laughs> And, uh, and, and, and I'm, I'm not ready for Sunday. And I was going back and forth, back and forth. And, and I said, you know what? The reality is right now, what, two good things, right? Two necessary things. But what's important right now, what God is telling me to do right now is not the sermon. It's the people. It's go to see these people. And, and, and so I, I, I was kind of battling this all week long. And I knew I would be, right? Because I'm preaching a sermon on distractions. And so I was like, there, there's no way I'm going to get through this sermon in one sitting, you know? And, and so I, I was working through it and I was like, just go ahead and mark it down. There's going to be distractions everywhere. And, uh, and, and a lot of conviction, too, because I'm prone to fall for a distraction. You know, that will send me a good distraction, and I'll just go for it every time. Uh, I'm that guy that's like, squirrel, you know. <laughs> I, you know, they, they'll, uh, in our Word of Life curriculum, we'll be working, and sometimes they'll have videos that they want us to, to share with the students on YouTube. And so I'll, I'll bring up YouTube, and, you know, they always have, like, the, the different, like, options down the side. And, and there, I have never once watched a video one time on YouTube where it was like, wa watch this video and then exit out of it. No, it's like I watch the video and I'm seeing all these other things. And I'm like, oh, you know, I need to see what is that about, you know, and, 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 and easily distracted, right? If, you, uh, if you've ever known someone who has their head in the clouds, 
Um, that, that's a terminology that we'll use, um, a, a phrase that we'll use, use to describe someone who is easily distracted, whether it's their daydreaming uh, or a conversation that gets them sidetracked or a random pointless project that they decide to undertake. They have their head in the clouds and they're overcome by distractions. And I say they, and I've already told you that I'm, I'm the guy. So if today you're like, man, Jake, you're stepping on my toes at all, just know that I had to step on mine before I got to yours. Uh, it feels like anytime I preach at somebody, uh, I, I, I have to get through myself first. Um, I shared with you over Realm that uh, studies have shown that an American worker uh, experiences one distraction every 30 minutes. One distraction during the workday, one distraction every 30 minutes. These distractions include responding to personal communications, text, or uh, messenger, or calls, or things like that. Maybe it's checking emails, having meetings, um, internet browsing, unexpected conversations with coworkers, and monitoring children or checking on their home. The same study found, though, now get this, one distraction every 30 minutes. That same study found uh, that... Uh, it takes about 23 minutes to get back into the task once interrupted. So every 30 minutes, you experience a, a distraction, and from that distraction, it takes you about 23 minutes to get back into productivity. And, uh, and, and so the reality is that every 30 minutes while you're at work, uh, most workers every 30 minutes get about 7 minutes worth of um, productive work done, uh, accomplished. In, a, in an hour, they get about 14 minutes. Over the course of an entire eight-hour day, uh, eight-hour work day, you might get away maybe with almost two hours worth of productivity. Uh, man, I started to think about that, and I was going, that is crazy. And then I started thinking about it and going, that is accurate. That is, <laughs> that is absolutely true. Um, whether these distractions are brought on by themselves, their own daydreaming, um, they're, maybe they're uninterested in their, in their work or um, they're, they're on their phones or whatever. Or if it's brought on by someone else, a co-worker, meetings, unexpected tasks. They, they, they feel the weight of it. Many of them stress. They experience a lot of stress because they look and they go, man, I, how is it I spent all day here and I didn't get accomplished the one thing that I set out to get accomplished? You ever go to the grocery store and you went there to get one thing and you walk out with like 25 things and not the one thing that you needed? Yes. Yes, we know that feeling. Uh, we, we, this this uh, survey, as they were talking about this, they said not only uh, do people uh, experience stress, but they, they find themselves annoyed with themselves, with their coworkers, with the task at hand um, because... They have been distracted. They're now carrying the weight of the emotions uh, of feeling like they're not accomplishing anything. And how do I spend so much time here and only this much is occurring, only this much is accomplished? And some don't even realize um, that it's not that they are simply ineffective or that they're ill-equipped for the job. It's not actually that. Um, They're distracted at their jobs. And because they're distracted at their jobs, they're rendered uh, ineffective. Because of the distraction, they could easily accomplish the job. They are well equipped to do the job. That's why they got hired. It's not that you're no good at what you do. It's that you're easily distracted. It's not that we're no good at the things that, that they saw something in you. They saw that they, they wanted to bring that about in you and they saw it and they went for it and they hired you because of that. But at the same time, we are easily distracted and pulled away uh, from the things that we're called to do, from the things that we're supposed to be doing. And if it's true for workers, it's, it's true for a stay-at-home, stay-at-home mom or stay-at-home parents. It's, it, it's true for the, I'm finally off work, but I have to go straight to my kid's game parent. It's true for the retired, but still somehow busier than I've ever been prime timer. If it's true for the worker, it's true for the students who are just trying to make it through whatever level of schooling that they're in, whether it's, it's elementary or, or even if it's maybe it's middle school or high school or even, even college, wherever you're at in your schooling, man, it's easy to get distracted, right? And so as we, as we think on this, uh, we understand as well that um, these, these distractions that can tend to rule our day, uh, they lead to different outcomes. 
we mess up or we miss out on the things that matter most. And, it, and the importance ranges as well. Uh, you were distracted, so you made the wrong move in a game. You, you were distracted by something, so you, you messed up the game. You, you were distracted, so you forgot to update your fantasy football league. Uh, I just created a bunch of distractions right there. I, I just, uh, right there, everybody's checking their phones. Uh, jobs have been lost and marriages destroyed because someone was distracted by other things and took their eyes off of what really matters. Others have lost their lives because they or someone else drove while distracted. Distractions. They can be dangerous. See, we take our eyes off of what we need to be doing. We lose track of what matters most in the pursuit of things that matter less. Or worse yet, do not matter at all. Today I want to offer you one thing. I want to offer you this one thing, this one thought. And here it is. If if your head is in the clouds... Your eyes are off the prize. If your head is in the clouds, your eyes are off the prize. If you're walking about distracted by everything else, guys, we've got to get our eyes back on the prize. We've got to get our eyes back focused on the things that matter. That's why I started off by pointing out church members who were not caught up in the busyness of their day or caught up in the busyness of this or that or the other, but they were going out visiting those that are in the hospital and visiting those who couldn't get out of their homes. There are people that are out sharing the gospel with others and, and being intentional about sharing their faith with other people. That's important because they've got their eyes on the prize. They know what matters most. And the question is, do you and I know that? If you want to simplify that, I know some of you don't like my cheesy little statements like that, so i got another one for you, but it's shorter, so maybe you won't be so mad at me. Uh, Distractions kill traction. Distractions, see it's cheesy, but it works. Distractions kill traction. If you're distracted, you can't move forward. If you're distracted, you can't do the things that you're supposed to be doing. Nehemiah understood this to be true and he refused to allow himself to be distracted from his purpose. And I don't have time to... uh, We are picking up halfway through a book uh, with a lot of things going on in it, okay? When they said, uh, let let us come together, the word together, uh, it's related to this idea of unity. And and so it's almost like an invite to, hey, let's work out our differences. Let's work this out. Let's get back on the same page. Come on, Nehemiah. Just just come down. We've been butting heads over this issue for a while. Let's just get together and talk this through. Let's be civil. And Nehemiah knew that that was a problem. He knew that they they were up to no good. It wouldn't have been a bad thing, would it? It wouldn't have been a bad thing to go and to to reconcile. And many times the distractions that you face will not be bad or evil opportunities. They might be good things at the wrong time. And you need discernment to be able to figure that out. Also consider the fact that he was a a cupbearer. And and some say that 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 was a, a, a prestigious job in the kingdom, but... I don't know. I look at that and say, you're carrying a cup for somebody. Like, I don't know that that's really a big deal. I'm, I'm sorry. I don't know what culture, you know, like culturally speaking, that might be a little different. But, but ultimately, you're still just carrying a cup for somebody. Now he's in a position where he's got governors and leaders of other nations and other uh, provinces that, that are inviting him to come together and have a meeting with them. Regardless of what being a cupbearer actually was, he is in a different role. And it would have been very easy to have been tempted by the idea and by the pride that comes with that. Sometimes you have to discern the motives of those around you. Sometimes you've got to discern the motives within you. You've got to discern the motives uh, that, that are inside of you. See, God expects us to grow in the area of discernment. Jesus was irritated with a group of his listeners when he said, You hypocrites... You can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it that you do not know how to discern the times? Discernment. The writer of Hebrews tells us that discernment is something that we're able to build over time. He said that mature, uh, speaking of mature believers, those who reason, by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Many consider discernment to be a spiritual gift. Discernment. 
When you're struggling with distractions, you need discernment on a spiritual, emotional, and practical level. See, discernment helps you to judge the motives of others. Nehemiah got the invite, but he saw through it. It helps you determine, determine if, if the things you are doing are helping or hindering your endeavors. We all need discernment. Uh, secondly, when, you're, when your head is in the clouds, you, your, your, your progress is easily derailed. You need determination. Progress is easily derailed. Like I said, uh, distractions kill traction. You and I, we have to be able uh, to stay, stay on track. In verse number three, it says this, And I sent messengers unto them, saying, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease whilst I leave it and come down to you? Yet they sent to me four times after the same sort, and I answered them after the same manner. I was thinking about this, this, this discernment that not only discernment, but this idea of determination. Nehemiah knew that if he came down to meet with them, the, the work that he was doing could cease. That it, it, it could very well possibly, it, it could stop. And, and whatever he was personally doing would certainly cease, whatever he was personally involved with. But even the, the work in general, what he was overseeing, if he stepped away, if something happened to him, what if this entire thing went back to the way it was before he ever showed up? He knew that the work that was in front of him was a great work that needed to be accomplished. And he didn't want to risk this work by going out and saying, oh, well, yeah, I'm just going to meet with these guys. I'm going to, I'm going to spend some time with them. No, he, he didn't have his head in the clouds. He wasn't distracted by these things. He wanted progress to lead to this achievement. But they were persistent. As we read the verses, they persistently uh, came to him. In, in verse number four, it talked about that. See, these distractions come and they, they go throughout the day. And it's even more so when you're trying to do something for the Lord. When you're trying to accomplish something for the Lord, the distractions are going to come all day long. I remember working as a teller in Panama City. We had uh, a, a big, uh, our, our bank, the, the drive through was separated from the actual bank building. And so we had a, a large, we were at one of the larger um, work offices or whatever you want to call it. We were at one of the larger drive throughs And so we had about eight or nine lanes and, uh, and there were a bunch of us that worked in there. And so uh, as I, I was working one day, um, we all managed about two different lanes. And, and so uh, on, on all these lanes, we're standing there and, and I, look, I look over and I, I, they, they said, I'm bored. There's nobody here. And I, I remember sitting there one day and thinking, you know, every time I, every time I try to I'm sitting here and I try to do my devotions. If I, if I just read my Bible, people just show up. People just show up out of nowhere. And so they, they're saying, man, I'm bored. I wish somebody would actually pull up in this drive through I looked at them and I, and I actually said this. I said, I said hey, y'all, y'all watch this. And I reached over and I grabbed my Bible and I put it in front of me and I opened it up and I just started reading. And while I was looking down, cars started pulling into the drive and they just started laughing. But the craziest part was all these open lanes. And you know where all four of those cars drove? In my lane and sat in my lane. There are open lanes and they chose a line to sit in. <laughs> Distractions. That, the, I mean, and the devil didn't even know. He was stepping into my trap on that one. I got him. I was able to tell everybody, look, what, look at this. Look what the devil will do. You know, but anyways, the, the, the point is, when distractions will come, especially when you're trying to do something for God. You're trying to do something for the Lord. He ain't going to let you just get off free with that. No, 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 no. You're gonna, it's going to take determination to get through this. You ever see a, a video of a train that's derailed? You know the... Uh, the horror that comes with something like that. I know that God has big plans for my life. I know that God has big plans for my family. I know that God has big plans for South Point. I hope you know that about yourself and your family as well. But, but the, the fear that I have is not that, that God cannot accomplish these things. The fear is that I'll get in the way of God accomplishing these things. I, I just don't want to be in the way. I don't want to be the one that slows it down. Did you know a lion can run in short bursts? He can run at 50 miles an hour. A, a lion, he can top out at 50 miles an hour. But, but the craziest thing is he can reach those speed in just a few seconds. 
He can go from laying down to reaching 50 miles an hour in just a few seconds. Can you imagine? My Buick can't do that. <laughs> he, to put this in perspective, if, if, if you were to put, lay a lion down in the ground of one side of the end zone, okay, and then you were to go 100 yards over here, that's not far enough for me, but you go 100 yards and you stand in the other end zone and you were to stand right here, you could be standing and do whatever you want. Standing right here, that lion could be laying down and, and minding his own business. He can look up, spot you, stand up, Start charging and tag you. I'm going to say that nicely. Tag you in six seconds. The whole football field. Six seconds. From laying down. Guys, I can't get up on my feet in six seconds. If I was late, we are in trouble. The, the reality here is, is, is the question that came to my mind was, so how does the antelope survive? Because they can't all run that fast. How does the antelope dis- dis- survive? It- it's determination. See, the, the lion can only maintain that speed for short burst. So the antelope, he has to decide, I want to live. <laughs> the antelope, he'll, he'll make dodges. He'll move back and forth. He doesn't just run in a straight line. He'll move all over the place. The antelope's got to make a decision. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live today. He's got to be determined And if he can survive for just a few seconds in that race, the lion will give up. The lion will quit for just a few seconds. Look, you and I, our our progress can be easily derailed when we get caught up in distractions. We need determination. Third, when your head is in the clouds, your mind is easily disoriented. You need dependence. 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 In verses 5 through 7, the enemies of Nehemiah write him saying uh, that, that they, believe, they, are, they believe and that they are reporting to the king uh, of Persia that, that Nehemiah plans to make himself king of Jerusalem and that is he, he is leading a rebellion. That's the whole point of him building this wall. And Nehemiah tells him, listen, you're just conjuring these things up in your own mind. You're just developing these things up in your own head. They just, they just wanted to put fear in his heart. It seemed to work to some degree. In verse number 9, it it says this as he's thinking on this. It says, uh, for they all made us afraid. He didn't say they tried to make us afraid. He said they made us, including him, they made us afraid. Saying their hands shall be weakened from the work that it be not uh, done. Now therefore, O God, strengthen my hands. Notice what this fear did not do for Nehemiah. This fear did not stop Nehemiah. This fear, it did, not lead to his, it did not lead his decision making. It did not persuade him to meet with them. It did not shake his faith. Instead, this fear drove him to prayer. And we know that Nehemiah was already a man of prayer. If you read before this, he's constantly just going to the Lord in some longer prayers and just some short prayers. But he was a man of prayer. See, he he knew that his strength did not come from independence. He knew that his strength did not come from him just mustering it up in himself. Yes, we need determination, but our, our determination isn't based on us. I'm not determined that I will be strong. I will make it through. No, no, no. I'm determined to depend. I'm determined to depend myself on him. On the morning of January 26, 2020, Kobe Bryant, his daughter, and seven others died in a helicopter accident. As the investigation unraveled, it's believed that the pilot experienced spatial disorientation in the clouds, which made him basically confused, and he didn't know which way was up. In his confusion, it caused them to crash into the mountainsides. This type of disorientation is is dangerous for pilots uh, and every pilot is cognizant of it they say if you hit turbulence and uh, and, and in the clouds if it were to push your plane up they said odds are your your plane actually stayed level when it pushed it up it stayed level but because you can't see and you don't have your senses because you can't see what's going on in the middle of the clouds 
You become kind of disoriented and confused. And your body tells you when it feels that push, your body tells you, oh no, the plane, the plane lifted up. And so in response, you push down. And you push the plane downward and create a dangerous scenario because you're just confused. You can't see. <clears throat> Causing the plane to go into a downward spiral. But spiritually speaking, we do the same thing. We get, we have this spatial disintor, uh, disintorientation or disin, whatever, that word. We, 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 get, we get messed up, right? We get confused. And, and as, we, as we start to, to, to panic, we crash. Look, what we need is, is the same thing that the pilots need. We need somebody outside of ourselves speaking to us. We need the instruments in the plane to rely on. You and I, we can't just muster up the strength. And we can't just say, I'm going to figure this out on my own. No, I need something greater than me. I need something outside of me to, 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 to lift me up, to guide me. Proverbs tells us to trust in the Lord with all our heart and do not lean on your own understanding, but in all our ways acknowledge him and he will direct our paths. When your head is in the clouds, your mind can become disoriented. You can experience this. You need to depend on him through it. And finally, when your head is in the clouds, your, your name is easily damaged. When you're not paying attention, it's easy to damage your name and you need dedication. Listen, when we read on in this story, what happens is someone close to Nehemiah was hired basically to betray Nehemiah. And, uh, and so this person goes to Nehemiah and, and tries to fill him with fear. He tells him, hey, look, they're going to come and they're going to try to kill you. You and I, we need to go hide. Let's go hide in the temple. Let's just go hide in the temple. Now, he wasn't allowed to do that. You're not allowed. They, they weren't allowed to go into the temple like that. And, and so he's, he's over here saying, hey, we need to go hide in the temple. But, but Nehemiah looks at it and, and explains in, in verses 12 and 13, he actually gives a little bit of commentary explaining that the Lord had opened his eyes to this man's intentions and he knew that, one, they wanted, they wanted him to run his life by fear so that they could point to, to his weakness as a leader. And two, they wanted to cause him to disobey the commandments of his God and his own beliefs. See, Nehemiah, he wasn't allowed to enter this temple. Only the priest could enter. King Uzziah had, had done this and was struck with leprosy. And I don't believe they cared much about his beliefs. I don't think that that's what it was. But I, I think what was going on here is they were just looking for anything where they could draw what he called an evil report. They wanted an evil report against him so that they could reproach him. He responds in, in verse number 11. I, I found it interesting the way he, he worded it. It says, and I, I said, should, I, should such a man as I flee, almost sounds prideful, but I don't think that that's what he meant by it. It goes on and says, And who is there that being as I am would go into the temple to save his life? I will not go in. I think what he's really saying here is not a man such as me flee. I don't think he's speaking to his own courage and bravery. I think it points to him as a leader. As a leader, I'm not called to run. I'm not called to back down. I am supposed to lead. I'm supposed to be in front. And then being a man as I would go into the temple, I think it actually is speaking to his sinful life. He knew he was a sinner. He knew he wasn't called to be, into that, be in that temple. He knew he wasn't supposed to be there. And to do it would be disobedience. Jake, where do you get this idea of dedication? Well, if he actually thought his life was in danger, this seemed like a safe place to go. Run right into the temple of God. Let God be your defender. But Nehemiah knew that the word of God said he couldn't do that. And so whether it cost him his life or not, he refused to go into what others said would be the safest place for him. He refused to disobey his God. Dedication. See, when your, your head is in the clouds, the enemy has a prime opportunity to bring you down. Your enemy wants to take you down. And one of the best ways he can do it is to take out your reputation. One of the best ways he can do it is to catch you on a bad day when you're in a bad mood and get you just to snap at somebody and then try to lead that person to church. Yeah, right? I've been there. 
I've been in those awkward situations where I had to go back and I had to apologize to somebody for acting goofy, for acting out of line. I've been there. Listen, we don't need to lose our, our testimony and lose our name uh, because we've been distracted by the things of this world. When you, when you finish the work that God has called you to, you, you read in the next verses, uh, we read where it, it says that he, he finished the wall. They finished the wall. But it also says that the enemies, as they looked on and they saw what he, he had done, they saw the accomplishment of this wall, the finishing of this wall, that they were challenged by it. They, they realized that it had been the work of their God. That's what he said. He said it wasn't that we had done it. It was that our God had been involved in our work. And, and, and this was a, a challenge and it, this was a, a, a witness to those around them. If your head is in the clouds, your eyes are off the prize. When you give in to distraction, you lose traction. Distraction is one of the very best ways your enemy is able to limit your effectiveness. So how has the enemy distracted you? That's what it all boils down to, guys. We can sit here and we can try to pull principles out of the Bible all day long. We can sit here and we can talk about doctrine and we can get into theology and we can go through all those fun conversations and we can show off how much we know about this, this, and this, or we can just figure out how much we all disagree about it. Uh, we, can, we can go through all that stuff. But if we're not willing to stop and ask ourselves the difficult questions, the personal questions that drive us to change, then, then we've missed the point. So how is the enemy distracting you? Maybe it's your devotions. Something as simple as getting in your Bible. Have you been slacking because you're too busy? Have you been missing more and more fellowship with the church or corporate worship for other things? Is there a ministry that you need to recommit yourself to? What areas do you need to refocus? <laughs>